for our last presentation, we'll be moving over to uh, Daniel von Strein and Francesco Di Toni, and they will be produce or presenting on the introduction to the big science project uh, and the and big science in general. Okay. Can you see that? Okay. Looks great. Okay, so. I'm gonna do a, a very kind of quick intro to the Big Science Project, and then I'm gonna hand over to look at one of the working groups that I think is particularly uh, relevant to uh, people uh, in this uh, audience. Um, so I'll kind of talk a little bit about the, the kind of motivations for Big Science, but I'm not gonna be able to talk about all of the work. So I'll share some of the uh, links at the end that kind of give you some further places to look. Um, so as a kind of starting point for the, this kind of project and the motivations for this project being initiated, probably a lot of you are familiar um, over the kind of past five, 10 years in, of this growth in uh, language models um, being used across a wide range of different natural language processing tasks and showing uh, you know, increasing performance on those tasks. Um, and one of the other things that you probably will be aware of is that over time, these models have got bigger and bigger. So on the right, we've got some of these models you might be familiar with. And you see that the kind of number of parameters is increasing all the time. Um, along with uh, the models increasing in size, we're also working with larger and larger data sets during the training process. Um, and basically what this uh, has kind of resulted in is that the resources to create and train one of these language models has become increasingly um, available only uh, to uh, uh, kind of a fairly small group of tech companies uh, within industry who can afford to train these models. Um, as one kind of recent example of a uh, model created by Google, this Palm model, uh, there's this nice blog post that tries to estimate what it would cost for someone else to recreate that using uh, cloud computing. And you can see the estimate comes out between $9 million and $23 million. So even for very well-funded academic uh, research institutions, this is uh, likely to be kind of uh, not something that they can directly work on. Um, so that obviously raises some challenges that uh, these models are trained for very particular uh, applications. Um, and they're usually not designed uh, either as research tools, but they're also often very difficult um, for academics to access in the ways that they might like to uh, in order to kind of interrogate how those models uh, are developed and how they operate. Um, another kind of limitations of uh, you know, leaving this work solely to industry is that um, there's quite a lot of duplication of effort where a lot of models are trained in private settings. And then as a result, the kind of energy goes into training those models is also duplicated numerous times. Uh, and the final one, which I think is kind of particularly relevant to this audience as well, is that traditionally there hasn't always been as much thought given to the construction of the data sets used to train these models as has been given to other kind of parts of the, the model development process. Um, and that often means that the models reflect um, biases in the text data they're trained on that uh, we might prefer that they uh, didn't. Um, so the Big Science project was kind of inspired by the Large Hadron Collider, which um, I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, and this, I guess, is a similar situation where individually it would be very difficult for anyone to set up the Large Hadron Collider. So the only way in which this kind of research could happen is by collectively developing this as a shared resource that is uh, shared by lots of different countries and organizations and then benefits uh, you know, a large number of researchers. Um, so the Big Science Project kind of wanted to emulate this in a way. Um, and the way in which that has happened is thanks to uh, a grant from the uh, French uh, supercomputer Jean Say, 
which has given uh, a fairly substantial amount of compute resource to this project in order to develop an open source uh, language model uh, that is trained on multilingual uh, data. And that uh, development happens uh, as part of this collective process with uh, by now kind of hundreds of researchers involved uh, in different parts of that, that process. Um, and just very quickly, I just wanted to kind of specifically um, mention why I think this is quite important to LAM organizations. Um, yeah, with this kind of question, which uh, you can probably guess the answer to, but of, you know, which organizations have already done a lot of this work to think about curating and managing large collections and describing those in a way that hopefully reflects their limitations and potential biases. Um, so I think in, in the, the kind of uh, project of big science, the kind of perspective of LAM institutions could be very valuable particularly around the construction um, of data sets uh, and how to kind of do that responsibly. And the other reason I think it's uh, important as uh, institutions increasingly going to be using these language models, I think it's also important that they're able to actually interact with those models in a more open way and not just be sending requests to a kind of black box model where it's not always clear exactly how that model's been trained, what, training data uh, has gone into that model. Um, so with that, I'll pass over and stop sharing. All right. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel, for uh, the introduction to the Big Science Project. Um, what I would like to do now, um, I'll share my screen as well. So just one second, sorry. Um, See if I can um, okay. Sorry, can um can you see my uh can you see my slides here? Yeah, that looks good. All right, yeah. So um oh, what I would like what I will present now, um as Daniel said, in, within the Big Science Project, um, different working groups were formed to work on different aspects of the creation of a large um, uh, language model. And um, uh, specifically, we created, we decided, we, we thought it would be interesting to have a specific uh, working group uh, working on applications for historical texts. And so we established this um, big science working group um, working on, on historical documents. And um, among the possible um, different topics we could have focused on, we decided that um, an, an interesting one was um, testing the abilities of large, large language models in um, essentially uh, inform, performing uh, information extraction tasks on historical texts. Um, in particular, um, we we were interested in in, um, in tasks of named entity recognition or um, identification of language and dates uh, um, uh, of historical texts and production um, language of the text and um, date of publication, and. Um, uh, in, in particular, we, we, were, we wanted to test the abilities of this model to work um, in a sort of in a, in a, uh, essentially uh, on with zero shot tasks, so with uh, with no training essentially. So I will give a brief presentation here of um, uh, some preliminary results we we had from um, experiments in this in this area, and that were presented at the uh, workshop at the last um, meeting of the Association for Computational Linguistics. Um, so, as, as Daniel said, um, we now have available a large, a large um, collection, larger collections of digitized historical texts on which we can uh, um, apply uh, large language models, and we have the opportunity to capitalize on essentially on, on big data approaches uh, to investigate um, uh, historical texts and answer um, uh, histor uh, questions based on the analysis of large collections of historical texts. And, and of course, named entry recognition plays a key role in, um, in these kinds of investigations um, as they allow us to 
uh, extract um, and link together uh, information from, from historical texts. But there are also some specific challenges in performing uh, NER on historical documents. Um, for example, the presence of noise in uh, OCR, since most of um, historical documents are um, scanned and uh, undergo optical character recognition after they are scanned. Um, there is, in general, a, a lack of, of training data sets compared to um, present day um, uh, texts, and also um, a lack of specialized um, machine learning models, language models for um, uh, to, to apply to historical texts, especially for languages that do not really are not um, spoken anymore, um, such as Latin. And then, of course, uh, there is the matter of the computational cost of training or fine, -tune, fine tuning models uh, uh, to be used on um, on historical documents. Not all the institutions that have to preserve or have to deal with historical documents have the, the resources to, to perform this kind of computational tasks. Um, so as I said before, what we were interested in was to, try to, to, to see um, how we could use transfer learning to essentially um, uh, use models that are already trained, pre-trained models and apply them to um, historical text and perform named entry recognition on them um, in a zero shot manner. So really with no with no training. And in particular, we decided to um, attempt um, uh, a prompt-based uh, paradigm, uh, which has been um, particularly, has, has had a, a surge, let's say, in, in popularity in, in the past uh, one or two years, I would say. And um, essentially what we did was to uh, examine uh, the zero shot abilities of uh, T0, which is a prompt based large language model uh, that was developed as part of the big science effort. It is not the final language model of the big science project, but it was um, um, an, inter let's say an intermediate language model that is uh, specifically based um, on, on, pro on prompt. So it, it is a prompt based uh, method. And um, the two main challenges in using this model and what we were interested in was the fact that the model was not trained to perform named entity recognition and the evaluation data set that we use was, was out of distribution since the model was trained on present day texts and we applied it in, instead to uh, multilingual historical texts. Um, and the specific, so we, we examined the, um, the zero shot abilities of this model in performing NER and also um, on tasks of language recognition and uh, time period recognition of historical texts. And um, to perform these experiments, we used um, uh, the Clef Hype 2020 data set, um, the, the 1.4 version, uh, which is a collection of OCR newspapers in English, French, and German from 1790 to 2010. And uh, there are four, um, sorry, there are five main um, coarse grain entities, let's say, in this data set, which are persons, location organization dates, and then the products, which include um, includes both um, names of media and names of, of doctrines. And really the experiment we performed was very simple. Uh, we essentially used uh, prompts uh, to ask uh, and ask questions uh, to the language model to determine if, uh, the, uh, if input sentences contained named entities for each specific entity type. And then we applied uh, filters um, uh, to, to keep only answers that uh, match entities, uh, to match words that are actually in the input sentence, and then ask disambiguation questions if needed, if uh, uh, the uh, same um, phrase or the same word was assigned to multiple, um, to multiple entities. Uh, we really, and, and we also applied um, disambiguation processes when we had nested entities, we always chose the entity with the largest uh, span. And so here you can see in these table examples of the prompts that we used for these tasks. So really, we um, we asked the natural language uh, to identify uh, the entities in the input sentences, and uh, the results. And um, um, unfortunately, were, were a bit underwhelming, but um, still interesting. We think um, we found it was very difficult to obtain an exact match. 
between um, the correct answer and the answer produced by the language model. However, um, we noticed that many answers are actually semantically close to the correct answer, but there were some types of recurring um, errors that made it um, essentially impossible to match the answer with uh, the correct um, the correct um, word or group of words in the uh, input sentences. Um, the, the first error we identified was, in general, the tendency of these prompt-based models to output an answer no matter what. So even if there are no entities in a sentence, um, they tend to produce uh, uh, an answer in any case, uh, sometimes just repeating the name of the entity. So um, a filtering step is really necessary when using these kind of models, we believe. Um, another big issue was the presence of OCR noise. So we, we observed that the, the model actually uh, produced the correct answer, but it um, tended to automatically correct the, uh, the OCR noise in the, um, in the answer. And, and, in, and so then it, it, this made it um, difficult to find an exact match with the um, uh, words in the input sentence. And finally, uh, since the uh, model we used, T0 had been trained only on English, uh, we found found that um, it also needed to translate the correct answer from the original language into English. So even if it identified the correct answer, let's say in German, then the our final output turned to be in English. Um, so here I just have, uh, we, we, uh, so what, what we did at this point, since we could not find exact matches, we analyzed the uh, answers using uh, normalized Levenstein distance to identify the best predictions uh, for each entity query in each sentence. So essentially we use a form of edit distance between the answer outputted from uh, by the language model and the original and the correct, let's say, word in the input sentence. And we set a threshold um, after basically manu manual inspection, we set a threshold of um, 0 0.4 uh, for uh, to limit the amount of false positives in the answers. Um, essentially, what we noticed is that um, in general, the most difficult entities to identify were products, uh, we believe because of the very um, uh, let's say, uh, generic nature of, uh, of the word uh, product. I mean, and when we ask for the system to identify names of doctrines or um, uh, publications, it really struggled to do that. But uh, we, we found that with names of persons and locations, especially on English texts, uh, it tended to, uh, to um, to, to have a certain degree of improvement in precision, especially with text towards, um, in the, from the second half of 19th century onwards. Still, the results are, are, are quite below state of the art, um, and primarily for, because of the um, types of error that I mentioned in the previous, uh, in the previous slide. Um, on the other hand, when we tested... Uh, no, uh, sorry, uh, just to, sorry to interrupt, but we are uh, slightly past the time, so I think people sorry. will begin to drop off or transition if they have other things, and it, it oh, might no. be good to come to a, a conclusion soon. Conclusion. Um, we, this is the last slide. We just, we found, however, that uh, the, this approach performed quite well in identifying the languages or the um, decades in which documents were published. So we think there are some limitations in using a zero um, short approach with prompts, but um, this was just, let's say, a preliminary experiment. We think that with different kinds of filtering and different types of prompts, it is possible to improve uh, the performance of these models. And this could be a viable solution um, for, for identification of entities in historical texts in, in uh, sort of uh, low resource environments. And uh, that concludes my presentation. Thank you so much to both of you. Uh, just one quick question. This is a uh, fascinating project because it is really promoting the reuse of existing models and applicabil applicability to LAMs. Is there something that the AI for LAM community could do um, or that would be helpful in promoting this reuse? Um, I think at this stage, perhaps it would uh, really, um, if, if, if there are um, data sets that are of particular interest for testing these kind of approaches, this would be something we would be, we would be interested in. Uh, there are not many uh, data sets for name entity recognition um, on historical texts, labeled data sets. Um, so uh, that I think would be something that I think could be useful. Um, Daniel, what do you think? 
Yeah, the only other thing I would mention, which I didn't touch on much today, but there's quite a big focus on the project around data governance and how to do responsible data governance when developing these large language models. Um, and there's a few people uh, with LAM backgrounds involved in that working group, but I think the, the idea is to take that kind of governance group forward. And I think the input of people um, you know, from LAM institutions would be very valuable there. Um, so if that sounds like something you might be interested in, I've put a, a link, uh, an email address rather, in the in the document that uh, it'd be great if you got in touch with, uh, with that email to express interest in getting involved. Wonderful. All right.